Welcome to the Dollar Commander Podcast. I'm Martin. I'm Eric. And I'm Sam. Dollar Commander Podcast is a budget-focused commander podcast. We firmly believe you don't need to spend a lot of money to have fun. We'll be going over a lot of new cards and commanders that don't break the bank. Today we're discussing the top 15 common and uncommon cards from Theros Beyond Death. Uh, The new set from Wizards releasing on January 24th. A lot of really interesting and cool stuff revolving the graveyard and enchantments. There's also a number of notable reprints, and we'll be discussing those really quick before we head into the top 15. My big notable reprint to talk about is Grey Merchant of Asphodel. Uh, This is a lovely 5-mana 2-4 that drains the table for your devotion to black. Uh, It's Commander Staple. The veteran commander players have died to this card before, and uh, young commander players will die to it soon. Uh, flicker it, reanimate it, play it a bunch, you'll have a good time. Yeah, uh, Grey Merchant of Ashfidel is really cool, especially uh, when you can loop it uh, with a lot of different uh, recursion spells, uh, definitely. I mean, it's cool when you're playing it. Yeah. Whenever <laughs> someone else drops it down and drains you for 15, it's less fun, but I mean, that's that's just how commander works. That's, that's commander, <laughs> right? <laughs> So the card I wanted to talk about today is a card called Underworld Dreams. It's an enchantment for a triple black that has, whenever an opponent draws a card, Underworld Dreams deals one damage to that player. Underworld Dreams was first printed in Legends block, got reprinted multiple times, but always managed to float around uh, 3 to $4, and never really dipped below that price. Really good in wheel decks, like uh, Necruzar the Mind Razor, uh, as well as Rakdos Group Slug decks. I'm really excited to see this get printed at Uncommon, uh, especially when it's been at Rare for so long. Yeah. And I hope uh, we all see more cards get downshifted like this, especially cards that are very much played in Commander that we'd like to see. Yeah. Underworld Dreams is kind of like this this weird niche, but popular card. Like, Nekasar is a super popular commander. Everyone loves their wheel decks. And, like, for some reason, despite the fact that the card sees virtually no constructed play anywhere outside commander, it kept getting printed at rare and didn't see any play. Like, it got, it was uncommon when it was first released, and then every reprint they're like, this needs upshifted. This card's too busted. I don't get it. <laughs> right. I think it's when cards get are really used in one deck and then just like only that deck really wants the cards so they just keep uh on stock for that one deck like nakuza decks really like this card and want to play with it all the time and because of that it's floating around three to four dollars matching the rest of the cards in a nakuza build usually but yeah no really excited to see it yeah thanks to theros we're down to 25 cents and plummeting that's awesome yeah, it's it's spicy. Um, I think it's great. The card I'll cover here is Heliod's Pilgrim. So this is a card we saw uh, actually not in Theros last time. It, it was actually from Magic 2015. But what's great about Heliod's Pilgrim is that you can fetch an aura whenever it enters the battlefield. Most of the time, this is just going to be when you cast it. But if you ever flicker Heliod's Pilgrim, uh, you can just get an aura and put it in your hand. Obviously, there's plenty of oppressive auras out there that you can have work well for you. We have that as a nice three-drop for any white deck you've got. I really like it in Slesnia. I like that it fetches my Song of the Dryads. I like that it fetches my Lignifies. It's flexible. It finds flicker form. It's just, it's good. Tutor on a stick. Yeah, in uh, Limited, I was playing this a lot to go into that four-mana enchantment that uh, makes a soldier when you deal combat damage but it's especially good in commander where you can go into something like bear umbra or some other particularly deadly r for four mana and play that on curve uh so that's always nice i'm really excited to see this get reprinted even though it was uh a common and the new art the new art's pretty dope Mm -hmm. Uh, the new art's great yeah all right we also have a couple of other cards uh that have been reprinted more or less expected, we've got the Temple Scry Lands. So basically, they just enter tapped, but you get to scry the top card of your library, uh, which generally is great for Commander and pretty much great wherever. Uh, we also have Idyllic Tutor. Uh, so Idyllic Tutor is, I almost would say, is kind of a surprise. I don't think anyone's expecting to see this come back, but it is an enchantment tutor. So you can go find an enchantment and then put it into your hand. I'm just really excited that they decided to reprint Idyllic Tutor. <laughs> the, the temples are probably going to be as cheap as they're going to get. They are at their best in Commander, I think. Like, that's kind of the format where they are 
they're fine turn one plays. You're not really upset to have the scry at any point in the game. Um, so yeah, it, like if you want a dollar land, I would go with a temple over a guild gate or a game land or anything like that. I think they work especially well uh, in Commander because there's not really a desperate need to be playing things on curve and always adding threats to the board. So if you take a turn off to play a scry land uh, and sort of filter your draws a little bit more, I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, and it's a really good first turn play for a lot of decks. So really excited to see this. The core 20 printing of the Temple Cycle uh, managed to drive down the price to maybe like $1 or $2. Currently, the Temples printed in Theros Block uh, are at $1, and that's really nice. It's nice to see uh, really good lands get printed so cheaply. Yeah, and Idyllic Tutor was a $20 card that's now 5 bucks and plummeting. Like, I don't expect that card to be expensive for much longer. I think the card is only really niche playable in Commander. Um, my... I've had a buddy that has argued with me that Demonic Tutor is better Idyllic Tutor, which I don't agree with, but, um, or not, sorry, uh, Diabolic Tutor. Um, but in any case, Idyllic Tutor is sweet white tutor. If you're playing the new Heliod deck, it's pretty good. Or maybe not in Heliod, but like just any deck that needs a vital enchantment, you play Idyllic Tutor because that gets you that vital enchantment. Is mm. it play Idyllic Tutor. It's going to be cheap. This is the time to get it. When you see reprints like Idyllic Tutor, uh, you should get really excited because while they may be niche tutors, reprinting tutors that are expensive for no real reason are really good, and I think they really help uh, the wallets of budget players. As a budget deck builder, as a budget player, uh, you don't have access to those most expensive cards, but when when people who are playing with the more expensive cards when they get tired of those cards when those cards come down in value you know all of a sudden more cards sort of trickle down to the to those uh of us who are playing budget decks so reprints are great and um it's really fantastic that wizards letting us return to some of these favorites like gary and underworld dreams so mm. very very cool that we get to see, get a chance to see these cards once again yeah absolutely well, let's uh, let's go into our top fifteen, um, and what we'll do is we'll each take turns uh, with our own top five. We'll each go with our our number five all the way to number one. So, really quick, this is just commons and uncommons. There are a lot of awesome rares and bomb rares. Uh, feel free to check them out. Um, some of these are going to be relatively cheap; others are not going to be cheap. Uh, we're focusing on the commons and uncommons because generally these are going to be pretty easy to get a hold of. They're not going to cost too much money. Many of them work great in a lot of the decks we already run. So we're going to discuss why they're good, why you should run them, and really what decks they go well into. Yeah, and this uh, this total top 15, um, each of our top fives, no repeats. We wanted to make sure that like we're talking about 15 different cards here. So you can expect five different top five from the, the three of us. That's sort of like a, a general list of a collective top 15, even if uh, we all have our own number ones. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with my number five here. Uh, I'm talking about Clothis's design. Clothis's design? The, the new Gruul God's design. Uh, we got a five and a green for a sorcery. Uh, uncommon. Simply says, really lovely simple text. Creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is your devotion to green. Uh, devotion, as, as we've seen before, is just it count the number of green pips you have. That's how large your team gets. Um... This is a really interesting pump effect. It's it's the kind of pump effect that it's comparable to larger ones than Overrun. So if you look at like stacking anthem effects like Collective Blessing plus uh, a Commander's Insignia plus you know a couple other blessing effects, that's the range of which Clothes Design starts to hit. Um, I think this card has a real potential in green heavy pip decks to be just better Overrun, um, but it's kind of niche in that area. Um, I expect, like, if you can get this to be plus 8 plus 8, and I don't expect that to be that difficult, um, it probably just kills some people, right? Like, if you have 8 creatures on board, Clothis design, your team gets plus 10 plus 10, yeah, someone's gonna die. But not having Trample's a pretty big deal, but, I don't know, I think this card just, it's a new overrun effect that is in a specific archetype, and I like to see cards like that. I think Trample, uh, or the necessity for Trample to combo with this card is really key. I think the ceiling on this card is very high. I think if you're playing a deck like Goreclaw, it can very much excel in that regard and really pump up your team to huge, huge numbers before you swing in. 
it really uh, matters whether or not you can get in damage through trample, or maybe if you're playing some sort of blue-green list that involves giving your team flying or some other form of evasion or some other way to get that damage through, that's going to be really important in making Clothis' design as great as it can be. Well, as a as an avid token player, there'll be some games where you'll just, like, you'll have 15 creatures on the board. Like, just incidentally have made a bunch of snakes off of something. Incidentally have made uh, just a bunch of, like, random goats that are lying around. In which case, the trample can be less important. Like, I play a lot of token decks where overrun just isn't big enough. Even if I have, like, 12 tokens, they're just getting plus 4 plus, or plus 3 plus 3. The trample isn't that doesn't matter that much. If I'm getting to play the team plus 12 plus 12, though, and I only have to get around 3 blockers... The trample, I think, isn't as relevant. So it, it's going to depend on the deck a lot. In a deck like Goreclaw, absolutely, the trample is huge because you just need, like, six things to kill everyone. But I think, like, the card has applications even outside of the trample bit. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's... It, obviously, this works really well in mono green decks that, that, that have a lot of green mana in them. However, they could potentially still work in a two-color deck. I know one of the first decks I, I brewed was Kron the Dawnclad, which has an impressive three green three white casting cost and my deck particularly ended up uh working around a lot of playing a lot of cheap spells getting a lot of devotion so i i think this this can find a home and i think you're probably right decks that have tokens or that go wide yeah it's solid all right so my number five is thirst for meaning two in a blue instant that says draw three cards then discard two cards unless you discard an enchantment card this is basically a functional reprint of Thirst for Knowledge, but it works for enchantment cards. The upside that artifacts have over enchantments in this regard is that artifacts are much easier to recur than enchantments, but I don't think that necessarily means that Thirst for Meaning is bad. I think on the contrary, it's quite good. If your Enchantress deck is in blue-white, it might be worth trying to run Thirst for Meaning with cards like Open the Vault, Retether and Dance of the Mains, which can all grab certain enchantments back that you discarded. I think that any deck that's running Crufix's Insight could also consider running this card as well. I think this card being played at instant speed definitely helps raise the ceiling or raise the performance level of what this card can do. Some decks that I think might want it are Bruno Light of Alabaster. You can discard Auras and get them back with your commander's ability really easily, so it's you're not really playing them with any Hmm. So I think the decks that want it are Bruno Light of Alabaster. You can discard ours and get them back with Bruno's ability very easily. So you're not feeling the negative cost of this card nearly as much as you would in a normal Enchantress deck. I think Cascadia the Cultivator, uh, who can also recur ours very easily, also doesn't really feel the effect of discarding an enchantment card. And I also think... Uh, Urtai the Corrupted uh, is a deck that revolves around sacrificing enchantments, and by nature of sacrificing enchantments, that means you don't necessarily value the enchantments you're sacrificing very much. So I can see this being run as a pretty good card draw spell on any of those decks. I honestly think uh, Thirst for Meeting and Thirst for uh, Knowledge, because just there are three mana instants that dig three deep, there are just a lot of decks that would play that, even if they're not discarding the enchantment or artifact respectively, right? I think Absolutely. Like a Talran deck, I think just decks that are the draw go, digging three deep is a lot. And that flexibility for it being an instant just means, oh, I can hold up my mana, and then worst case scenario, I'm drawing three cards. That seems pretty good. Like, Grixis Storm probably loves that effect, right? Like, I, I can see this card being generally well applicable, and then in the specific, like, the Bruno Light of Alabaster deck, where it, it's, it's nuts that's kind of where the card is at its best, but it just it has a really low floor. Like, we talked about the really high ceiling on Clothis' design. This card is just good. Like, there's never going to be a commander deck that will be upset to have a Thirst for Meeting in hand, I think. Any commander player knows that drawing cards is power. It doesn't really matter if you're going to discard a card if you can draw three. Uh, so the fact that it's three mana and you can play it in an opponent's turn is just fantastic. But yeah, I think I agree with you. works best in decks where you either want the card in the graveyard or more importantly if it's an enchantment card you can just get it back and i i think the uh the other deck i would consider putting this into would be hannah ship's navigator which can recur back uh enchantments and artifacts yeah it, just having a three mana spell that says draw three cards by virtue of uh mana value ma makes it really good i think mm. especially at instant speed like that's 
that's flexibility right there. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right. My number five is Drag to the Underworld. So Drag to the Underworld is an instant spell that costs two black black that basically is destroy target creature. The wrinkle here is that it costs X less to cast where X is your devotion to black. So sometimes this could be a four mana spell, but more often, most often, it's going to be a two mana kill spell. Now, black has its share of good removal, but even the best removal for less than three mana has some kind of drawback. We've got Doom Blade, but it doesn't work on black creatures. We've got Cast Down, right? But it doesn't work on legendary creatures. Even Fatal Push doesn't work on everything. It's got some limits, too. What's great about Drag to the Underworld is it has literally no drawbacks. As long as your devotion to black is two or more, which, unless it's the very beginning of the game, it won't be hard to do, you have a two-mana removal spell, point blank. It even counts towards tax inducers like Tithe Taker, Talia Garden of Thraben, and the new Kalaf Beloved of the Sea. So if, if your spell suddenly costs more, if you've got enough devotion to black, you can offset that tax. Uh, and it's just a generally good utility removal spell. It can work well in almost any black deck. Uh, that being said, there are some commanders with stronger black color identity that will work better, especially those who react to death triggers. Uh, for example, Alenda, the Dusk Rose, uh, Lazav, Demir Mastermind, Toshiro Mizawa, and of course, Siaheni, Undying Partisan. So I um, when I see Drag to the Underworld, I'm reminded most of Victim of Night, um, which is just black, black, instant, destroy target, non-werewolf, vampire. I think it, it does, I think it's vampire, zombie, werewolf, right? Those are the three modes that it doesn't hit. Because it's basically unconditional, but there are those weird games where you're into the zombie tribal deck where it just doesn't hit it. And I think this card's probably just about as good as far as just a really efficient black removal spell. And I, I think there's something really to be said for playing efficient black removal spells. I do think it's, it's pretty cute, the interaction with taxes that you mentioned. I love the idea of, you know you're playing into a Grand Arbiter and just drag to the Underworld will always still cost you black black. I find that compelling. Um, but yeah, it's neat. It's fine. Um, yeah, drag to the Underworld. Good card. <laughs> Not not much else to say about it. I think it's um, superior to Doomblade, definitely. I think if you're running a very heavy mono black deck, you can get some really good value out of it. Even if you only have one black devotion when you cast this, it still is an equivalent to murder, and murder's still getting played in like thousands of decks. Mm-hmm. And this mm-hmm. has the potential to be even better than murder. Um, Murderous Compulsion, and all the other conditional two-mana removal spells go for the throat. It really, if you're in a mono-black deck, I don't see why you don't play this as really solid removal. Uh, my number four, hopping over to the cards that are starting to get spicy, um, we're looking at Annex Hardened by the Forge. Uh, this is a card that I will defend as Red's Pawn of Ulamog, as far as like how good the card is. Wow. I think, yeah, <laughs> Annex Hardened by the Forge is just doing so much. Um, oh, oh, let me read the text. Let, let's read the text of this card. So, yeah. it's uh, one red red for a legendary enchantment creature demigod. Uh, it says, Annex's power is equal to your devotion to red, uh, so it's a star. Uh, and whenever Annex or another non-token creature you control dies, uh, create a 1-1 one, one satyr creature token with this creature can't block. Uh, if the creature had power 4 or greater, create two of those tokens instead. Uh, and he's a star 3. So, uh, basic gist of him is while he's out, whenever a non-token creature dies, you get a satyr. Whenever a four-power non-token creature dies, instead you get two. Uh, aristocrats really like these effects. Mm-hmm. Pawn of Ulamog is probably just slightly better because you can also sack the tokens to themselves for mana, and that's like that's a huge deal. Uh, but I think Annex making two of them when a four-power creature dies is also a huge deal. Um, you can get in all kinds of nasty loops with things like Ashnaw's Altar. You can get... Um, that, cause the fact that he counts himself means combo-tastic synergies exist with Nim Deathmantle, although that card is just busted on its own. Um, but like even as just a value piece, you can slam him down as a, a Mono Red's protection. Someone clears the board. You go, great, I have eight 1-1s. And then the turn after that, you Tears of Rage and kill them, right? Like, 
the card is just so powerful because it just leaves more stuff on the board. It is a protection piece, it's an aristocrat's piece, the card just does a lot. And then even like its other effect, just being a high power creature for Devotion to Red, that's just good. Like mm -hmm. it'll eventually just have 9, 10 power on board and people have to block that. Like they can't take 10. It, I just, I'm a huge fan of Annex Hardened by the Forge. The only thing I think that makes me slightly reticent to Annex is the fact that the tokens can't block. And I think that's that's a really important part of uh, token generation is the ability to chump block with the tokens. It really doesn't matter, though, if you can immediately sacrifice them to effects. So I think Annex really has a lot of potential to really get there in a lot of aristocrat strategies, especially red-black ones like Lysolda or Timuret or a, a lot of other different red-black aristocrat stacks. The one that came out in Ravnica... The one that came out in Ravnica Allegiance. What's that one's name? Yeah, Judith the Scourge Diva. Yeah, Judith the Scourge Diva. Yeah. So I, I see actually a, a ton of potential for this card. I think like even if you look outside of Rakdos, like Jund Aristocrats with Prosh or Corvold, like or, this card just yeah, doubles yeah, the number of things you sacrifice. Yeah, I think uh, like Sekuar, that's another one, right? Yeah. yeah. Commanders that get better when things die. Alicia maybe could work with this. You could bring bring creatures back from the graveyard that you've maybe sacrificed. Uh, obviously, there's a handful of phoenixes that might be power four or might be close to power four. It could be buff, uh, buffed up. You might be able to recur and, and get extra value out of. Yeah, I, I think much like how Pond of Ulamog was slept on for a long time of being like a, a 30, 40 cent bulk rare or bulk uncommon, I mean. Um, I think Annex might get slept on in Commander and instead to see some standard aggro play. Um, but I really think, I think this card's the real deal. Like, I think a lot of Commander decks are going to want to play Annex. I think the people who originally missed Pawn of Ulamog will definitely be paying attention now that Annex Hardened and the Forge is released. I think this card is really good. My number four card is Furious Rise. Furious Rise is red enchantment for two and a red. Uh... At the beginning of your end step, if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, you can exile the top card of your library. You can play that card until you exile another card with Furious Rise. It's fitting that my first card was Thirst for Knowledge for Enchantments, because this is basically red Colossal Majesty. Uh, I like this card a lot because it can give you a lot more time to plan for next turn. The fact that it exiles at your end step means that you can sort of choose whether or not you want to play it until you get an entire turn cycle, and I think that's really valuable. It lets you cast a lot of uh, instants as impulse draws, which is something that we don't usually see in the impulse draw effects that exile the top card of your library and let you play in until the end of turn. And having this card do that really fills in this niche that I don't think existed before it. There's a lot of really fun ruling tricks with this card as well. If Furious Rise doesn't trigger, either if it gets destroyed or you don't have a creature of power for a greater, that card remains permanently exiled until you cast another, or until you exile another card with Furious Rise. And because of that, if you manage to flicker it, the card that gets exiled is treated as a new card. So I, if you continuously find a way to flicker Furious Rise, you can just keep exiling cards from the top of your library, and basically you can play them until the end of the game, or wait until turn 20 to play it if you want. Blue and green already have plenty of cheap card draw effects, so I'm not sure if this replaces many of the blue-green card draw that already exists. Like, Colossal Majesty is really good, and budget... But if you're not in blue or green, I definitely consider running Furious Rise. I think that the decks that want it are Perforos, Bronze, Blooded, because I think that you can always ensure you have a big dude out on your side of the battlefield uh, to be exiling cards with. I think Firesong and Sunspeaker, which is in Boros, Boros is not well known for having very good card draw effects. I think that Firesong and Sunspeaker would like it, especially because they play a lot of instant speed spells. And Iros got a victory. Again, another Boros deck that relies on having lots of creatures uh, to make sure you can continuously be exiling cards with this card's ability. Yeah, I think this is one of those cards where a lot of players are just going to kind of ignore it but it's secretly going to act like an eighth card in your hand or you're a red player. You probably won't always have seven. Just that extra card every turn. What What is really interesting, and I, I know you touched on this, but if Furious Rise goes away, you can still cast that last card, which is kind of cool. 
I um I like its comparison to Colossal Majesty, although I I disagree in one respect. I think this card's actually quite a bit better. Um and I think the card's quite a bit better because it triggers on end step instead of upkeep. Like there are so many games, Commander, where you'll curve this into a 4-CMC Commander that has 4 power, get the Exile draw trigger, and then a board clear happens. And then your Commander gets removed. And then your 4-power creature no longer exists for your next upkeep, right? And Colossal Magistry will have drawn you 0 cards throughout that duration, but Furious Rise, you can, like, you can plot out to guarantee get value out of this. This card will basically almost always cycle itself. And that is, like, a that's a real value that Colossal Magistry doesn't have. And again, I think it puts this card several echelons higher than that. I actually think there might be some underhyping of Furious Rise going on right now, because this card, it happening at end of turn is such a unique mechanic to deal with. It, I think, even outclasses in some decks Outpost Siege as a, just a better playable red draw engine. I think there's going to be a lot of times where just being able to hold on to like a chain reaction in your Furious Rise because a board clear happened, that's just going to be there that you can still cast like a card in your hand. Like, it... This card, I think, is quite a bit better than it's even being talked about here. I think this card is... It goes in a lot of four-power commander decks. I think it works well, especially if you're in Boros, because you can run things like Hour of Revelation or Planar Cleansing that re-destroy all non-land permanents, and you can still keep the card you exile with it and still play it until the end of time. So I think that this card works really well with those, like all-consuming board rafts that just wipe everything and i think that i think that's definitely an area where this card can excel yeah i think we can kind of compare it to phyrexian arena in i think it's honestly closer to phyrexian arena than it is to colossal majesty in specific decks mm. and i think if we get to make that comparison the card is a very good one. Oh yeah definitely my number four is dream shaper shaman Dream Shaper Shaman is an enchantment creature, Minotaur Shaman. At the beginning of your end step, you may pay two in a red and sacrifice a non-land permanent. If you do, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-land permanent card. Put that card out of the battlefield, the rest on the bottom in a random order. Essentially, this looks a lot like Chaos Warp, which is arguably the best red removal spell in Commander. Uh, Dream Shaper Shaman is kind of a curious take on this very fabled card. It effectively lets you cast Chaos Warp, but only on your stuff at the end of each of your turns. So with a little bit of work, it's possible to manipulate the ability beforehand by scrying or returning a card on top of your library. Where this card truly shines is finding big cards with strong Enter the battlefield effects, such as Mirror, Battlesphere, Ravager Worm, or Rakdos the Showstopper. Commanders that have death triggers will like this card the most, including Mathis Fiendseeker, Judith the Scourge Diva, Thraxamundar, Crash the Bloodbraided, Sequar Deathspeaker, Rien, Angel of Rebirth, and the new Annex Hardened in the Forge. And yes, Corvald, Fae Cursed King, if you happen to have him, he also likes it too. So there is some really cute things this card does. Um, the first card that jumps to my mind whenever I look at Dream Shaper is Vivistic, Vivictus Asmati the Dyer. Uh, he wants to be doing exactly this effect anyway. Um, this card wants to be in decks that like sacrificing their own stuff, like you said, but also flipping cool things into play. Um one particularly neat interaction I like is in Ilharg the Raze War. So uh, f come with me on this magical journey, friends. <laughs> you attack with Ilharg, cheat in a Dream Shaper Shaman, pray that it connects and doesn't die, go to your end step, pay two in a red, sack it, and flip like a Blightsteel off the top. It, <laughs> it is in those kinds of cute interactions that I think make the card very fun to play with. I'm not, I'm not sold on its power, but I think at its minimum the card is... It does some spicy things and can just be out of nowhere. Oh, yes, look at my 12 drop that is now in play for five mana or whatever, right? Like, it, you can do some pretty silly things with it. I think Chaos Warp is definitely the best red removal spell in Commander. I also think that Chaos Warp has a lot of potential when you play it on your own permanence in response to something getting removed. The fact that it limits itself to your own permanence is a little bit of a downer, and the fact that you need to do it at your end step and you can't do it at instant speed is also a little bit of a downer. However, it's completely undercut by just the insane possibilities that it can produce. We've talked about Ilharg, we've talked about the new Perforos. 
we there's so many red decks now that revolve around getting huge dudes into play and beating face with them and the fact that this card can just grab them out of the deck for three mana at the very low cost of just sacrificing any like mana rock or any dork or anything you have just lying around makes this card really good i think chaos decks will just have fun with this you know like what is the top of the library what is it going to be uh and i think that's you know sometimes that's just some of the most fun interactions you're going to have in commander you can do some cute things with manipulating it i'll show the infinite can kind of be a deck where this could do something if you're playing an off-brand Elsha where you're trying to control what's on top of your library to flip cool stuff onto play. That could be something that you might want to think about. I think top deck manipulation with this card probably makes it quite a bit... Oh, we get to shuffle first, don't you? Do you shuffle? No, no, it just flips. Oh, so yeah, yeah. You okay. Yeah, so yeah, you, so top deck manipulation does happen, yeah. So you can run your scroll racks, your tops, your uh, brainstorms mm. to try and get big bombs into play that Dream Shaper will cheat in. Yeah, that seems pretty decent. I think right, that's yeah. the biggest difference between uh, Dream Shaper and, and the actual Chaos Warp. There's no shuffling involved, um, so yeah, you makes, can set it up. That makes this effect quite a bit better. All right, team, here we go. Another fun card. Uh, <laughs> this one is less generally powerful, but I think the card on its own as a commander is very good. Uh, this is Siona, Captain of the Pileas. Pileas? Pileas. P-L- or P-Y-L-E-A-S. She's one green-white for a legendary creature, Human Soldier. She's a 2-2. She has a lot of text. So whenever she enters the battlefield, look at the top seven cards of your library. That's right, seven. You can reveal an aura from among them and put that card into your hand. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. And she also has, whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a creature you control, create a 1-1 white Human Soldier creature token. I was stupid excited about this card whenever it was spoiled and i to this day still am it its effects not only are very unique they're not something we've seen stapled together before or go wide she has two particular spicy interactions uh the first one the good one in my opinion the better one uh, is shielded by faith um which is for one white white you enchant a creature uh it gets protection or it gets indestructible it gets some effect that's not important the important card text on the card is um whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control you may uh attach shielded by faith to it effectively goes infinite with siona so you can just make as many tokens as you'd like it's a may ability so you don't have to move it so eventually you can choose to stop after 5,000, and then you five thousand one ones they're gonna have a pretty good time but with this in mind she's also just really good at enchantress decks in cast the cultivator she digs seven deep for an aura cast is all about enchanting your stuff and getting in there flicker form is really degenerate with this card because you enchant her with flicker form you Exile Flicker Form and her and all of the auras on her, and they come back into play. You get that many 1 1 tokens. You get to dig the top seven deep for another aura. Yeah. It, like, it, the value that this commander generates is absolutely insane. If you're a deck brewer, I highly recommend tinkering around with Siona. I think Siona has so many things that you can abuse with it. Um, and if you just go do like a scryfall search for like green or white auras, and see what you can find. You can find some real gems. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but when I was looking at Sam's Siona deck list that he posted on Budget Brews, I started looking at different Siona tech, and one card I found was a card called Alpha Status, which was printed in Scourge Block. That's Enchant Creature gets plus two, plus two for each other creature in play that shares a type with it. The more tokens you make, you can like make Siona like a 2020 in your R's deck. And I think that's just really cool. There's a lot of really interesting synergies that uh, Siona has that play with a lot of old cards and a lot of new cards. And I think that like as a commander she's fun to play with but even just in the 99 like digging seven cards deep is a really good effect like that token producing effect is just gravy a siona is a really good card yeah i think there's a lot of powerful cards that can work with with siona um immediately i think of shalai voice of plenty yeah. which is um it's that white angel from dominaria that lets you put a plus and plus one counter each creature you control. So kind of the go wide theme there. Uh, there's also a few kind of spicy auras that let you reattach, which is kind of cool. So you can basically just for you paying about two mana, you can reattach an aura onto a creature and get another creature. But I think you can have a lot of fun with the deck, even without going infinite, so to speak. 
I think the fact that you can just look at the top seven is really cool. So she's one of those commanders that you won't ever feel horrible having to recast again. Yeah, that's a really great point. Like, she's, as a commander, you can take her in so many directions, and you never feel bad when she dies because you just put her back into play. Um, and often, like, Aura decks, you feel awful when your commander's removed because that's a huge value loss, but she digs for your value. Um, you can play this deck as as degenerate a combo machine as you'd like. Like I said, because you have Reign of the Vine Steed in addition to Shielded by Faith, um, with an altar out, you win the game, basically. Um, so the ability to find those cards is really easy in Selesnia, so you can play, like, this particularly well-tuned uh, Enchantress combo deck. You could also just play Aura Go Wide Good stuff, where you're just trying to play the in all the auras that say this gets plus two plus two for each creature you control, right? Like you play the Idol on a battle that gives your uh, enchanted creature one one for each creature you control. You play um, Alpha Authority and things that let it be unblockable and just try and one shot somebody with a gigantic person because of the number of creatures you control. You can go just full on Enchantress, just get the nuts value off all of those auras that you're chaining together, and just end up going wide and killing people with like collective blessings and stuff. The deck just can go so many places. It's a really neat... She's super fun to build around. I can't recommend enough. There's Shackles, there's Flickering Ward, there's Whip Silk. There's so many enchantments that, like, return themselves to your hand or reattach them or do something else. And I think that, like, that's where a lot of the fun in Siona lies. Yeah, you can build it just like SRAM. You can build it just like um, any of the classic... Uh, conviction decks where you're just like you're spamming the same enchantment over and over again getting seven constellation triggers making eight one ones doing like all the bananas value stuff you can play it um to do really cute aura moving around thingy majigs there's uh this one there's a kitsune oh the name escapes me but the important bit is after it's been enchanted twice it flips into a thing that uh lets you pay one to move an aura from a creature to another creature so you just basically pay one as many times as you'd like to make that many one ones which is a pretty sweet synergy uh overall it's just like She's good. She does a lot of stuff. She's fine in the 99s of the Aura decks. Like, she'll fetch out your Castia's Bear Umbra, um, but she also is great as her own commander. The card is just good. My number three card is Acolyte of Affliction. Acolyte of Affliction is a four-mana human cleric for two, a black, and a green. Uh, and when it enters the battlefield, you put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, then you can return a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. There's a lot of competition for Golgari cards that recur things. Like, lots of competition. There is no shortage of Golgari cards that can recur. They archetypes built around this stuff. So where does Acolyte of Affliction line up in comparison to all those other recursion effects? I think this card's pretty similar to Nyx Weaver, which mills two during your upkeep, and then you can exile it to grab back a card. Nyx Weaver is really good because it provides a consistent mill, uh, and it can get back any card, but it costs more mana and it exiles itself to be able to recur anything. So I think in that regard, the ability to reuse Acolyte of Affliction makes it really good. I think a better comparison would be Golgari Fine Broker which was printed in the Return to Return to Ravnica block. While the Fine Broker has a better body, it's also more restrictive in mana cost, and the Acolyte lets you mill some extra cards to get a better selection. So I think in comparison to those two cards, I think this card is better than those two. Some cards that I think might want it. Marin of Clay and Neltoth would love this card. You can constantly be sacrificing it, recurring it, grabbing back other things. Maybe if you mill an Ashnod's Altar or something, you can grab that back, or another... Great Sacrifice Outlet, you can grab that back pretty easily. Izoni Thousand Eyed, uh, that's another really... Izoni Thousand Eyed is another commander that really likes milling cards and creatures and recurring creatures. So I think Izoni Thousand Eyes would get a lot of mileage out of Acolyte of Affliction. And the last one, which might be a little bit of a weird pick, but Yurik the Desecrated, I think, would really like this card because you can mill to grab a permanent back, mill to grab a permanent back. You can really stagger your mills so that you can grab back the best card out of your library at any given time. Even if you decide later, hey, I actually want the first card that I milled with Acolyte of Affliction, you can grab it back using the second trigger. Uh, so yeah, really, really love this card. I think it works really well with spells like Blood for Bones, where you can do like a two for one. You can sacrifice a creature, you can return this to the battlefield. 
return something else back or Cavalier of Night or some of these other cards. The Really, it's just taking advantage of the enters the battlefield effect. I think um, Sadisi Brew Tyrant is the number one card that jumps to my mind whenever I think of this card. Um, she wants you to be milling small groupings of cards to make creatures. Uh, this pulls one of those cards back out of the bin. Um, and she sometimes can be an abusey ETB kind of deck where you want to be getting as much value off of flickering creatures, off of creatures just coming in out of play. Um, she has a really easy time doing that. Um, the one reason I think this card is honestly worth talking about, because I, I do think its mana cost is a little bit prohibitive, is it's just it's an enter the battlefield creature that recurs something and fills your bin stapled together, right? So this is like Eternal Witness and Stitcher Supplier had a baby. And that card is compelling to play whenever you can loop it. Because it means if you can loop just it, you can both mill your library and draw half of it at the same time. And that is a powerful tool to have access to on a single card. Like, you just need only it and infinite flicker to draw your library. And that seems quite good. Um, granted, that is a lot to ask for four mana that doesn't in my opinion do all that much else by itself i don't like playing golgari frying broker if i can help it i think like regrowth effects are generally better because they're way more efficient um but where this card is powerful it it's going to be powerful in a way that i don't think people are going to see coming i think people are going to look at an accolade affliction and be like that's not particularly threatening and then you do some reanimation loop and you have won the game <laughs> and that's where i think this card is particularly bananas right i think uh your sadisi brood tyrant comparison is really well warranted because i think it touches on this idea of indiscriminate mill in edh where you don't necessarily care about putting specific cards you just care about putting your entire library into your graveyard um so i think about like cards like hermit druid which do a lot of mass milling um but those decks want to keep milling all their cards, sure, but they also might want to grab some stuff out of their library as well, or they also might want to grab some stuff out of their graveyard as well. So I think that's what sort of makes this card really good, is the fact that it can lean into both those strategies pretty well. My number three is Mystic Repeal. Mystic Repeal is one green mana for an instant. Put target enchantment on the bottom of its owner's library. So Magic has its fair share of enchantments that can radically change how the game is played. Far too often, I'm in a game of Commander, and one of my opponents is playing Mystic Remora, and they're just drawing so many cards. Big cards like Doubling Season or Omniscience can snowball quickly for a single player. There are, there are too many powerful enchantments that can just overtake the game, and yet are really hard to get rid of. Uh, in Theros Beyond Death and the original Theros, we also have all these gods that are indestructible. It can be really pesky dealing with some of these. Destruction effects are often considered temporary in Commander, uh, since we have so many ways to get things back. And some targets can even be strong against exile effects. We've got the Cavaliers from, from M20, for example. With regards to enchantments, though, uh, if you can't exile it, the next best thing is to tuck it. And Mystic Repeal effectively tucks an enchantment to the bottom of a controller's library. It just costs one green mana, and it's at instant speed. With the new release, we're bound to see people include new enchantments into their decks. Be ready with this awesome new removal spell. This is a utility spell. It can work in pretty much any deck that plays green. Uh, certainly there are going to be some commanders that will like it a little bit more. Commanders that with direct synergy include Rashmi, Eternity's Crafter, Riku of Two Reflections, Eric Smethi's Slumbering Isle, that's the, the, the land that becomes a creature, and also Gaddock Teague. Whenever I hear anyone say Gaddock Teague, I just get like post war flashbacks of not being able to cast any spells in my hand <laughs> yeah. and a meek stone in play so all my creatures are tapped and can't do anything and i'm just standing there staring at the port but uh yeah. i don't play cdh i don't pretend to know cdh that well i know food chain is a good deck in cdh and having a one mana way to tuck it seems kind of good but on top of that like you were saying i think the most pertinent reason to play this card honestly is the pharaoh's gods like we already have nature's claim to destroy enchantments like doubling season um and yes, they can be brought back out, but often just the temporary removal is all you need. But dealing with gods, like if someone sticks Perforos, old Perforos, the impact tremors Perforos on turn four, you're probably dead the next turn. Like if they're a reasonably powerful Perforos deck, that card just has to be answered. And this is one of few ways to do that. 
Because most of the time, these gods aren't creatures. Most of the time, you can't pass them. Most of the time, you can't swords them. They have to get removed some other way. This is a really good way to do that. Um, and again, the downside mode of, well, it, it best case scenario, or it's worst case scenario, is it gets rid of a very problematic enchantment. It's going to happen in Commander. It's going to always be on at some point in the game. So you're never going to be upset to have it, but especially with Theros Beyond Death and all the new gods, this is this is the time to run this card in your green decks, kids. If you at all don't feel a need to run your Nature's Claims, if you don't feel a need to run your Naturalizes, put this in instead. This will do a lot more work. So, two things. Uh, number one, I don't know what you're talking about with Gaddic Teague. Uh, he's the Kithkin tribal commander, and that deck's always very fair. <laughs> oh, sure. That, uh, of course. What was I thinking? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what else you can do with him. I think he's a perfectly fair commander. Uh, and number two, as an enchantment lover, never play this card. It sucks. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see this running around my metas, because talking enchantment, especially if you don't have ways to get it back out, is the worst feeling in the world. Um, but it's a great feeling when you do it to your opponent's stuff, especially with all the new gods running around. I think this will absolutely be a fantastic card. So my number two, uh, then we're getting the cards that are quite, quite good. Uh, Nyad of Hidden Coves, uh, two and a blue for an enchantment creature, Nymph. As long as it's not your turn, spells you cast cost one less to cast, and it's a two, three. Oh, man. This card, um, I'm not normally a huge proponent of discount effects. I I find often they're too niche. Um, the best ones being things like Nightscape Familiar and Grexus decks, cards that discount effectively all of your spells. Um, most of the time you see, like, your creatures cost one less, or enchantments cost one less, and those just aren't consistent enough mana for me. This just discounts all spells as long as it's not your turn. And there are enough decks that like to say draw go um, that this... This card just discounts their deck all the time, right? Like, if you're running, if you're running Talrand, if you're running Rashmi, if you're running Sig Rather Cutthroat, right? Like, if you're playing Ra like Wrath Capuchin, like, you would just flash stuff into play at end steps, this card just discounts your entire deck by one mana. Um, that effect seems quite good. Now, granted, this costs three, and three is a lot. It's on a creature, so it is relatively easy to kill. But the discount it can get you in a rotation of the table, like, if, if you untap with this card, you can save outrageous amounts of mana like you can be like in a storm deck you just you just go off and on someone else's end step and the game ends right this card seems quite good especially again if you're playing the ley line of anticipations and if you're playing the dolcan orries right like i can just see this card being back breaking in the right circumstances as effectively like a gigantic mana expanage fun fact about me Rashmi, Eternity's Crafter, is like my favorite card. That card came out basically when I started playing Magic. And I didn't, never opened it, but all it had was one limited game against it that made me fall in love with it forever. So I think the fact that this is so suited to Rashmi might make it my number two favorite card of all time. Uh, I have no idea. I think uh, another card to compare this to is Brawl, Chief of Compliance. Uh, which also gives you discounts to your instance. But I think this one is definitely more applicable when you start getting to a lot of flash decks like Rashmi, Taurand, and Raph Capuchin, definitely. Uh, so yeah, I think this card has a lot of value, and we'll have to see how long it can go. Especially for a common. That's like, that's the thing, thing I think that's the most interesting about this card, is that they printed this card at common. It doesn't have the beefiest stat lines, but really it's not... It seems much stronger than just a common. Yeah, totally. The uh, <laughs> what was the joke? The 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 two three vanilla creature that's just a wizard. <laughs> this is this is a little bit more, right? I mean, it's it's also an enchantment. So, and and I guess theoretically that could it could matter in the right deck. Obviously, make sure that if your friend is playing Baral, they probably shouldn't be playing Baral, but. Or not be your friend. Right? <laughs> or like, maybe they're they're not your friend. Uh, obviously, if they're playing, if they're playing Baral. They're no longer your friend. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, it makes counter spells a lot more uh, easier to cast. Uh, there's a lot of... Actually, there's a lot of really good flash cards that's, that have come out in the last... Um, even, like, the last year. We have a fair number. There's kind of a, a theme going on in, in Theros Beyond Death. We've I think there's, there's at least three or four commons that have flash. Um, so certainly if you have new cards from the set... You might be able to incorporate them into into an okay deck there. I think um, this is one of those rare instances where it being an enchantment 
is a gigantic downside. This card is like a removal magnet where it just incidentally dies to basically everything. Like artifact enchantment board wipes, kill it. Creature board wipes, kill it. Target removal for creatures, kills it. Target removal for enchantments, kills it. And like that's kind of, in my opinion, the biggest weakness of this card. Um, but there just there have been more and more decks I've been seeing played that you just want to be holding up mana, like flicker decks um, in Rune. If you're playing um, any of like the lands, Simic decks have access to Alchemist Refuge, but you also now have the colorless um, option to play the um, from it's the one in sack. Your cards get flashed this turn um, from oh what is that card? Oh, Emergence Zone. Emergence Zone, yes. Emergence Zone just lets you cast spells at instant speed. At flash speed, like this card just discounts all of those. For times whenever you need to make the big game winning plays, this just can net you three to four mana, and that seems quite good. Yeah, I I think it works. For, I really want to play it in an is it deck because yeah. we've got like all those other creatures like Glo- Goblin Electromancer that that discount your spells. There's a number of spell reduction cards that actually don't cost that much money that you can kind of throw in. Um, Arcane Melee is one that comes to mind. Arcane Melee ends games quickly. When someone resolves an arcane melee, instants start flying around like crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Factor fiction just becomes ever that much cheaper. A commander I'm thinking of right now is Jory and Ruin Diver, uh, oh. which is lets you, whenever you cast a second spell each turn, you can draw a card. And think about how much easier it is to plus when all your spells are discounted on your opponent's turns. Um, so yeah, this card's really good. Oh, Eric, don't don't worry. I will be talking all about Jorian in my number one slot because, <laughs> oh baby, am I? Ex- oh, I'm so excited to talk about that card. <laughs> so my number two card is Hydra's Growth. It's a three mana enchantment uh, that has enchant creature. When Hydra's Growth enters the battlefield, you put a plus one plus one counter on enchanted creature, and then at the beginning of your upkeep, you can double the amount of counters on the enchanted creature. We've only previously seen this card effect on mythics like Colonian Hydra and Primordial Hydra, and one-off effects like Solidarity of Heroes. Being able to consistently double counters every turn on a 3-mana aura at Uncommon is just insane. Like we talked about for Naiad of Hidden Coves, I think there's just this weird like rarity problem that this set has, where they're putting things that should be rares or mythics at Uncommon level, which is definitely great news for us because that means they'll be cheap enough for us to play it. There are an unlimited amount of commanders with plus one, plus one counter themes. Uh, I was really struggling to narrow down the commanders I want to talk about specifically for talking about this effect um, because there are so many possible things. Not only if you're playing like a counter shenanigans commander, a commander that abuses plus one plus one counters, but even if you're just playing a Voltron deck and you need an extra boost, like this card will definitely get you there if you can protect your commander. Put it on something like an Uriel the Miststalker or something, and you can definitely grow it to be very threatening very quickly. And not to mention uh, all the counter synergy it has. I mean, God, just put on like a Fathom Mage or something and just see your card value like triple overnight. Uh, so some of the decks that I thought would want it gave Guru Spores. It's I feel like I'm insulting your guys' intelligence for even mentioning this, but like double encounters on Gave, really good effect. Definitely want to be doing that. Marwin the Nurturer uh, gets abilities based on how much power it has uh so i think this effect would definitely be valued there and uh last but not least skull briar the walking grave is a deck i've always thought was super cool but never really got around to building but the fact that you can put a counter on immediately and just be continuously doubling all the counters and they'll stay there forever makes this card insane and really good value in a lot of different decks yeah you can't go wrong with with hydra's growth the like the like the name suggests, it obviously works really well in Hydras, but there's a lot of Simic cards that are are going to be a lot of fun with this. Um, Hadana's Climb, that's the legendary enchantment that can flip into a land. It wants three or more plus one plus one counters, which is going to be a lot easier to get to. Uh, Simic Ascendancy, if you just want to want to get an alternate win. Uh, even cards like Ordeal of Nylea and Ordeal of Thassa from the last Theros block. 
again, if you have three plus one plus one counters or more, you can either search for two lands or you can draw two cards. And those are just two mana spells, which is kind of cool. I like Rayhan, Last of the Abzan, so it could fit into a, a black green deck. Of course, he's partner, so you can have more colors too. But if a creature dies, you can move those counters. Uh, so you can save the counters for later, uh, much like Skullbriar. I think... Uh... The my, like my favorite application of cards like Hydra's Growth are honestly just little things like Fertilid, like curving two mana. If Fertilid is two mana, three mana, three mana, two mana activation. Unlucky. So curving like a, <laughs> curving like Gyre Sage into this, you're going to be producing a truckload of mana if no one answers that. Yeah. Like, you can accelerate yourself to turns like eight or nine on turn four because you have a Hydra's Growth on a creature with counters on it already, like. If you do this with a Fertilid, sometimes you're just, again, if no one can answer it, the fifth turn of the game, you're pouring, like, six lands into play. You can do just so many powerful things with this card, and you only need to activate, like, if you can get it to stick for one to two turns, and you put it on the right creature, you're going to set yourself up with such an enormous advantage, it's going to be really hard for your opponents to recover. Granted, it's, it's, it's an aura. It has aura problems because it sets you up for two for ones. But as long as, like, again, if you stick it on a Marwin the Nurturer, all of a sudden, one untap and you got 50 mana. And that's quite good. Right, yeah. Um, one more shout out uh, to my favorite uh, Dominaria legend, Halar the Fire Fletcher. Uh, oh, that, that's spicy. Which, <laughs> whenever you cast a spell, if it's kicked, you put a counter on it, then it deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of counters on it. The problem with Halar is that it takes a lot to get going, but when it gets going, it's insane. Imagine Hydra's growth slapped on a Halar. I mean, like, if if you're listening to this podcast and you doubt Hydra's growth, look up how many commanders interact with plus one, plus one counters, uh, and I guarantee you'll your opinion will change about this card because it is so good and it can go in so many different green decks. Oh man, I just I need to touch on Halar because like the deck so often just is you run every single cheap kicker spell in the game and then just as many ways to dump counters on him as possible. And now you can just like put 10 counters on them, double them, kill the table. And that seems good. Mm -hmm. that, that seems like that gets there. <laughs> Definitely. All right, my number two is Mirror Shield. Mirror Shield is an equipment artifact, so you can pay two to cast Mirror Shield. Equipped creature gets plus zero slash plus two and has hexproof, and whatever a creature with that touch blocks or becomes blocked by this creature, destroy that creature, it is equipped two. So you might say, okay, well this sounds kind of familiar, right? We have a few different equipment that gives my stuff hexproof. I think the, the takeaway here, um, most commander decks really want equipment to help protect their commander. Equipment's really powerful, and the fact that we have an extra one is actually very important. Equipment is almost always colorless, and it sticks around even when the permanent is removed from the battlefield. With rising prices of Lightning Greaves and even Swift Foot Boots, Mask of Avacyn is another one. It's another, another hexproof equipment that you can add into your decks. Mirror Shield suddenly becomes a pretty smart pickup, um, and it can work in pretty much any deck. So especially if you're trying to brew that deck and get it under a certain dollar amount, just substitute Mirror Shield in and it'll, it'll do the job. Certainly any deck with a strong Voltron theme, a commander that wins through commander damage, and they're doing all the heavy lifting, they're going to benefit the most from additional piece of Hexproof equipment. A handful of examples include Kemba, Ka Regent, Nazan, Revered, Blacksmith, Atrata the Silencer, Bruna, Light of Alabaster, and of course our friend Yaheni, Undying Partisan. I think... um. The biggest and easiest comparison to this is Mask of Abyssin. And both cards, are, in my in my vision, like my, my mind, what basically they just do is they read as two mana equipment that equipped to get hexproof. The big difference here, though, is this equip cost is two and Mask of Abyssin's equip cost is three. Equipment, the bulk of their power tends to be related to how much they cost to equip as opposed to cast. Because once they're on the table, your ability to react or re-equip them over and over and over again makes them a lot better. It's why, like... Swiftfoot Boots and Lightning Greaves are just the staples of the format, specifically Greaves, just because it you can guarantee the protection for no extra mana, and it's a huge deal. Two mana 
is not a particularly steep rate. Um, and the plus O plus two, honestly, is just fine. It means lower early aggressive creatures aren't going to be an issue for you basically ever. It means that you, sometimes you survive a damage-based board, like a Languish, that you wouldn't have, um, which is which is an effect. But just the fact that it's only two mana to equip and goes in any deck that you have an engine commander, any deck that you have a Voltron commander, any deck that has your commander has to stick for it to function. Um, two extra mana to give it hexproof, that's fine. I, I play that in a lot of budget decks, but I just I need the 30 cent card, and this card's the 30 cent card. This card will at least save me from playing Ring of Evos Isle, which is a much worse Hexproof right. Granter yes. equipment yeah. <laughs> uh, that I put in a lot of my decks because it's nice just to have cheap Hexproof. Um, I think the fact that this equips for two is huge. That puts it at a better rate than Mask of Avacyn. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to miss that one power, and I get that nice Death Touch ability, which is niche, granted, but can definitely work when it works, you know? Um, and sometimes it can just randomly blow people out. So Someone rolls up with a Glyph of the Traitor deck, and you go, ah, 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 not this direction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so uh, Mirror Shield's definitely really good. I think it will definitely find a role in a lot of decks that want to protect the commander. If you happen to be running Hungry Links, then then it turns out maybe that that little niche Death Touch Clause is actually pretty important. Because then you'll put you'll give rats to your opponents with death touch, and then you can just kind of ignore the rats because you've got the the hungry links at your disposal with the mirror shield equipping the mirror shield. I think like realistically, it's just going to look like two mana equip for two creature has hex proof, and that's functionally what mm-hmm. it's going to do for your deck, and that is just a powerful effect. Like that just and you can spend twenty five cents, right? Yes. So that's that's really what it comes down to, right? My my top card of this format, I believe will be a surprise to many, uh, but he's truly beautiful. Uh, it is Stinging Lionfish. This is one and a blue for an enchantment creature fish, 2-1, with this lovely test. Whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, you may tap or untap target non-land permanent. Oh, okay. So, Stinging Lion... <laughs> stinging Lionfish... I like to call Baby Seedborn Muse, which isn't exactly what it is, but you functionally get to untap something critical every single other player's a turn whenever you have the ability to cantrip. There are going to be deck archetypes where this card is like the linchpin of how it functions, where you're going to net like stupid amounts of mana, stupid amounts of value off of this card each rotation of the table. Um, I'm an uh, avid Amara Soul of the Accord player, and that deck is all about tapping and untapping your stuff during every player's turn. And this card does that to an outrageous degree. In in decks like the the easy ones to go for are right like your your Talran decks, your Jory End decks, decks that want to be casting stuff on everyone's turn anyway. Um, but untapping a Gilded Lotus, untapping a Nyx Lotus, untapping just like a Signet often is just going to net you enough mana to cast bigger and bigger things and keep the train rolling and keep the value just going to outrageous degrees. It like the the worst case scenario of this card is awful. It's a two one for two that doesn't do anything if you can't turn it on. But the moment you have a mana rock in play, this card suddenly becomes three extra mana every rotation of the table. Which is very, very good and costs one less than Naiad of Hidden Coves. Um on top of just untapping big mana rocks, it kind of like fosters this new deck archetype we've been seeing pushed in draft last couple sets of the draw two on opponents' turns, on the play spells on opponents' turns archetypes. And I really love that deck. Um, I told you all I'd be talking about Jorian again. Uh, and here we go, because Jorian is kind of like the only commander that has the text of do stuff on your opponent's turns. Um, and not the only commander, I should rephrase. She's a commander that does this, um, where this card just turns that deck on so much faster. I, I can have I can go Soul Ring on one, Signet on two, Lionfish and just pass, and now I'm playing nine mana worth of things on my opponent's turns at instant speed, which is really, really, really powerful. Um like the card just it can do so much. You play it with Shimmer Mirror, you play it with Wrath Capuchin, you play it with Arcanus, because it untaps your tapped creatures, things like Rune, things like Arcanus. It untaps those things critically. You can play it in so many weird decks. And the more like, you think, do I want to be doing things on my opponent's turns? If the answer is yes, you probably should be playing Stinging Lionfish. It's just, the card is so cool. The card is so incredibly cool. My, my personal favorite and last little bit of the rant is Jace's Archivist. So you can wheel 
four times per rotation of the table with stinging lionfish and cantrips, which I find hilarious. So, like, that Nekusar deck, if you tool the deck correctly, all of a sudden, 28 cards are being burned each rotation of the table, and that seems pretty spicy. So I think this card really excels uh, with the mana rocks that don't naturally untap themselves. So I think, uh, for budget purposes, the main one we'll be talking about is uh, Basalt Monolith. And I think that the ability to just be constantly casting four, like four plus mana instants for reduced cost really makes this card excel. It's pretty sad, actually, that Nyad of the Hidden Coves got printed in the same set as Stinging Lionfish, because I think Stinging Lionfish does what Nyad does, like, ten times better. I think untapping a colored permanent is insane. And I think that yeah, you definitely want to play both, I'd argue, and see where that gets you. Uh, someone you didn't mention that I think would be worth bringing up is uh, Derevi. Uh, I think Derevi oh, yeah. decks will really like this because you get a creature that you can attack with. It's a 2-1, so maybe don't be throwing it into your opponents like Darksteel Juggernauts and whatnot, but Darksteel Juggernaut can't block. What, what's a big creature? What's the what's the big infect creature I'm thinking of? Lifesteel Colossus. Yeah, thank that you. That one can block. I don't know why it would, so you... it should be tapping and attacking, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, what's a, what's a good, I don't know... You, you obviously don't want to be throwing Sting Lionfish into, like, your opponent's uh, Avenger of Zendikar or something. Like, it's not going to do well. But I think if you can use it to untap a permanent during your opponent's turn, um, I think that makes Drevi, like, that much better. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't know. Hey, guys, we finally found a card that breaks Drevi. <laughs> 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 it took so long, but we finally got it. Um, but, yeah, Sting Lionfish really good, and I think it definitely deserves to be one of our number one uncommons yeah i i like i think um i don't know if you talked about a zombie uh a zombie is where you uh lady of scrolls you can tap wizards to draw a card i think it could work well there there's a card kaho minamo historian this is from saviors of kamigawa and kaho has this really interesting ability where you can pay x and tap to cast a card with converted mana cost x exiled with Kaho. So I think if you did this right, if you had enough mana or if it was a pretty low but effective spell, you could tap and cast it with Kaho and then just untap Kaho. And you could just do that on on each opponent's turn. Yeah, that seems good. I think the fact that when Sam was going through this, he named like 10 different commanders and we're still naming commanders. Like, and, and I, I, think that, thought... I think that... Sorry. Like, I, I hadn't even thought of Derevi as being, like, the absolute, like, a really bonkers commander with this card, but Derevi Stacks is a very rude deck, and mm -hmm. this card breaks that parity super well, because it gives you four extra untap abilities, at, or sorry, three extra untap abilities, and that seems pretty good. Um, you, can, you can untap stuff during your opponent's turn, too. Well, like, And yeah, you can, well, here's the other really cool thing, you can tap down their stuff, too, because this lets you tap or untap permanents. So, like, in your upkeep, cantrip tapped on your soul ring is a real line this card can take pretty often, right? Like, it, its flexibility and ability to just synergize is insane. It, I think, like, if comparing it to Nyad, Nyad, I think, will be, on average, better on its own. But whenever Stinging Lionfish is set up, the card can just do degenerate things. Like, this is the kind of card that enables ridiculous locks that you're gaining 12 mana on your opponent's turns and shutting off four of their things, right? Like, it just, it seems so insignificant, but it abuses some of the most powerful cards of magic, and that's good. And honestly, I didn't even think of Azami when you brought it up. And I think the fact that we're talking about non-wizards to put in a zombie. I think Stinging Lionfish is almost like an auto-include there. You could use buyback spells. There's, like, mind games. Oh, if you really so want to be a degenerate. Mind games, buyback, two, two and a blue, but the spell costs a blue. Tap, target, artifact, creature, or land. So, basically, four mana. You could tap something and then get the extra tap or untap and just, with enough mana, <laughs> just, uh, just really make a nightmare for everybody. I don't know, the more we talk about it, the more I'm sold on it. When I saw this was your number one, I think internally I was like, what? Uh, untap your, you can give your creatures vigilance, but yeah, this is really good. <laughs> it does very dirty things with lots of powerful cards, I love it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait to untap a Nyx Lotus that's tapping for eight like three times. That just sounds like a oh great time. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> and like you can use it to cast the spells too. And Green's got some extra cards now with with Theros Beyond Death to to truly make some of these mana um, hmm. mana generators just even more oppressive. Oh yeah. Yeah. So my number one card is Soul Guide Lantern, which might be uh, another card that makes you scratch your head, but I'm going to do a Sting Lionfish for this card because not only do I think it's the best non-rare in the set, I think it's the best card in the set, including all rares, all mythics, Underworld Breach, who's that? I don't know. Soul Guide Lantern is what I want to be playing in every single commander deck I build. Let's talk about its ability. So, Soul Guide Lantern is an artifact that costs one mana. When Soul Guide Lantern enters the battlefield, exile a target card from a graveyard. You can tap it, sacrifice it, and exile each opponent's graveyard. And you can pay one and tap it to sacrifice it and draw a card. I think this card is one of the best graveyard hate spells we've seen printed. It exiles on under the battlefield, which is really good at gunning down little one-off pieces that you don't want to waste an entire removal on, like uh, Wonder or Life from the Loam, but you definitely want to take it out as early as possible because it can win people games. So yeah, just playing this on like turn three after your opponent does their setup can be absolutely devastating. You can keep the card up and you can crack it for free, uh, like Relic of Progenitus. Uh, you can also use it to... Actually, is that true? Hold on. Relic has to, you have to pay mana, which is important. Yeah, I was making... I was wondering if you can... You can't crack Relic for free. You can't exile all cards from all graveyards for free. Yeah, you have to pay one or another card. Yeah, and the fact... You can basically play this, tap it immediately. Or I don't know why you do that, because you can just keep this up at all times. And I think the most incredible thing here is that it doesn't hit your graveyard. We only see that effect on very few cards. The only one I can think of is, like, Leyline of the Void. And that's a four-mana black enchantment. So I think the fact that we're seeing this on an artifact means we can run it at anything. uh, And I think that makes it really powerful. So not to mention the fact that you can just crack Soul Guide Lantern to draw a card. Um, which is also a really good ability because that means if you ever don't need Graveyard Hate at the moment, sack it, it cantrips, and you can just uh, move on from it. So if you can make use of Recurring Soul Guide Lantern, because again, you don't exile your own graveyard with it, I think that makes this card really, really good. Some decks that I think might want it are Brea, Ethereum, Shaper. Brea really likes eggs, and Brea really likes cracking eggs to use them repeatedly, and Brea decks are usually pretty good at grabbing artifacts back. And I think the fact that this doesn't hit your own graveyard, again, makes it really valuable for Brea. Mojoth of the Gravetide can recur this, sacrifice it to draw a card, use it to exile everyone else's graveyard while keeping their thing alive. You would be worried about getting it copied or stolen or something, but again, you can crack it in response for free. Dreddy Scrap Savant, another graveyard-based deck that might have some interest in recurring artifacts. So I think that also makes it really good. And basically, I think you can play this, because it's an artifact, you can play it in any deck that wants non-symmetrical graveyard hate. And I think that's too many decks to mention. So I'm really high on Soul Guide Lantern, and I think it's going to become a staple in all the decks I build. I think it's a really good hate piece if you have a graveyard-centered meta. I really love Soul Guide Lantern, and I, I love it because the typical graveyard hate cards I think of are Tormod's Crypt and Bojukabog. And the thing is, they only target one graveyard, whereas this targets all your opponent's stuff. So I think it's it's fantastic that it's not one-sided, and it does protect your own graveyard, which is also really important for actual graveyard decks. Like, it, it's it's not uncommon to be in a, in a playgroup where... There are multiple decks that are that are doing stuff, you know, returning instants or reanimating cards. I love that you can activate it right away. Unless, you know, there's some sort of an ability where it comes into play tapped, you can just crack it immediately if you want to. And I also kind of do like the fact that, yeah, you can just leave it there. It's just like this card that everybody knows about. It's on the battlefield. It looks horrible. You have to play around it. That's really the thing. And if someone wants to destroy it, you can just sack it and draw a card, right? Like, so great that it replaces itself 
It only costs one mana. And you also just get to exile a card for free. I, I think that's fantastic. I, I like I, I'm trying to find something bad about this card, and I honestly can't think of anything. I love me some eggs. Um, Psymaster Thopterist is one of my favorite decks to pilot. I'm, as I mentioned prior, a token aficionado, um, where every deck I own includes tokens. But in that deck, your graveyard is very, very important. Um, yet even in it still, I run stuff like Sentinel Totem because it's a really cheap way um, monetarily, because the deck's like 20 bucks in total, to exile graveyards. And then mm. I get sad because my Scrap Trawler doesn't do anything anymore. This card is just so much better than that. It's kind of outrageous. I have a hard time justifying putting in this kind of graveyard hate and like decks that have otherwise very efficient graveyard hate that don't care about graveyards. And by that I mean like I don't I think Bajukabob often just does the job um alongside like one or two other incidental graveyard hate pieces. In egg decks specifically though, this card is just so egregiously powerful you can do just insanity level things with this card. Because oftentimes you just need a card that sacks to draw a card for one, um, to go off, and this does that. This also is, like you guys have said, one of, if not the best, graveyard exiling effect on a rock we've ever seen. Um, Tormor's Griff costing zero is a pretty big upside for that one, but this has just way more modes. And I really mm -hmm. do think, like, it shouldn't be undersold that its ETB also hits a target. So, this comes into play, kills a crucial target that is a reason most people will fire a Bajookabog, and then you hold it up and they can't use their graveyard again until they remove this threat. That is, like, if, if someone burns, like, a Nature's Claim, if someone burns, um, like, an Abrupt Decay on your Soul Guide Lantern that you crack in response, you are feeling very, very good about getting that 3-for-1 on a 1-mana colorless artifact. Um, other card that I should mention here is Teshar, Ancestor's Apostle. Um, that card loves oh. its reanimation loops and stuff. It's, Birdman. Yeah, Combo Birdman is, um, it, it's, it, yeah, Bomberman, whatever <laughs> the name of the deck is. Um, Something like that. Yeah, your whole goal is just to get in these loops, and this is another egg that incidentally hoses a lot of powerful archetypes. Yeah, absolutely. I know this is my number one card, but I think the only major obstacle I can see to not playing this is deck space. Um, in 100 card formats, it's surprisingly hard to justify running this one card. It's easy to run something like Bojukabog because, oh, you play it, it exiles, and it sticks around and maintains value. And so I'm not sure who wins in the battle for the soul of Graveyard Hate between Bojukabog and Soul Guide Lantern. I think the fact that this cantrips really makes it okay because it cycles for two mana. And there's a lot of really good cards that you can cycle away for two mana and not have to worry about. Yeah, so I think the fact that this card just cycles makes it really, really powerful. And I think that that sort of makes me feel better about playing Graveyard Hate, which I think is better than something like Tormod's Crypt, because Tormod's Crypt can only be Exile, but this card can be a, another card in your deck if you really need it to be, uh, only for the cost of two mana. So I think I'd much rather top deck something like Soul Guide Lantern than I would Tormod's Crypt in the late game if I'm about to die. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? I do. I do think um, the, I mean, the Tormod's Crypt often is just powerful because it is a zero mana card. Um, like that often is just like, oh, I have I cast my, my Joy Roll the Weatherweight on four, play three zero mana spells, draw four cards, and then prep to storm next turn, right? And Tormod's Crypt is one of those. Um, and I think that they're, you run them in different decks, right? Um, Soul Guide Lantern, I agree, is definitely more generally applicable, where it has a way lower cost to put in your deck just because the cycling is so easy to do. That it makes it way more of a useful tool, I think, than Tormod's Crypt would be to many decks. And I actually feel that way, um, like, it goes in more decks than Bajukabog does, because Bajukabog can only go in black decks, and this can go in all decks. Like, you play this in mono green, you play this in mono white. Like, it's just good in both of those deck archetypes. So the last card here, my number one, is Whirlwind Denial. Uh, Whirlwind Denial is two and a blue. It's an instant. For each spell and ability your opponents control, counter it unless its controller pays four. The, the flavor text is no, no, and no. <laughs> That's... <laughs> <laughs> Which might be, might be the best flavor text in all of Magic. Honestly, this card's worth running just for the flavor text. Just for Treats. the flavor. <laughs> yeah. Say it while you cast it. Yeah, you don't even, don't even announce the name. Just yeah. point to the spells you're countering and be like, mm, no, no, and no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, you know, at first this just looks like a regular counter spell, right? Um, just counter unless you pay four for multiple spells, right? 
maybe two players are are casting spells and one guy's responding to the other person and they're kind of, you know they're doing all kinds of stuff and then you're like nope but sure and it can do that and maybe you've got that player at the table and he's got a storm deck and you know there's all these spells in the stack and yep it works on that too but what really makes whirlwind denial great is its ability to counter abilities so activated abilities of course, is when an opponent has to go like sacrifice something or pay a large cost, or otherwise they're about to go off, right? You can stifle it. You can use it on fetch lands, right? So someone's going to tap and sacrifice their land to go. You can actually counter that. In fact, much like stifle, you can counter triggered abilities. So really, any 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 triggered ability or activated ability, those are the two that use the stack that actually can be countered. It's it's incredibly strong for decks where the commander, the players rely on their commander for gameplay interactions. So like, you know, the commander is sort of the glue that makes the whole deck work. You can easily thwart someone's plans the very last moment. It's It's good in any blue deck. You're not limited to a storm deck or a heavy control deck. It it can pretty much pull its weight. You don't have to know going into the game what you're going to counter. It. You can just kind of use it when it feels right. And you can kind of do it when that guy is being really salty or that, that girl has been really salty on you and you just want to shove it right back in their face. And, you know, four mana is still a fair amount. Obviously, late game, when mana is more abundant, it's, it's going to be a little bit easier to deal with. I mean, players love maximizing what they can do in a turn. Four mana is not an easy feat. Decks that really want it, Drow New Lich Lord, Urtai the Corrupted, Jace Friends Prodigy, uh, Noyan Dar is just like a random commander that, you know, sure, you just cast a spell and you can do something. That What's really great is like, you'll almost never find something to counter. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a card that'll be in your hand. You can pretty much use it on almost anything that's happening. Talran Sky Summoner, which just goes off whenever you play instance or sorceries. I want to I wanna propose a line of play here using the Theros Beyond Death cards. Can we so make this you're... a segment? <laughs> the Sam's <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> no, no, hear, hear, hear me out, hear me out. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we have a Knight of Hidden Coves in play. Our opponent goes to activate the ultimate of their, I don't know, uh, any Planeswalker ever. We flash in an Omen of the Sea, triggering our Stinging Lionfish to untap our Nyx Lotus, tap it for three blue devotion to cast Whirlwind Denial, countering their ultimate. Mmm, mmm, that seems spicy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, uh, beyond just fun interactions of all these cards have together, we were talking about rarity, right? Flusterstorm is a one-mana blue instant that has Storm and Counter-Target instant or sorcery, uh, unless their opponent plays one. I'm kind of convinced this card is better. Wow. <laughs> That's a statement. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that that kind of power is stable to a card, if you're playing Battlecruisery 7 or 8 Power Commander, a three-mana worst-case scenario counterspell is good. A three-mana counterspell that is also a stifle is excellent. A three-mana counterspell that is a stifle, a Flusterstorm, and... A counterspell is insanity. Like, the, the card is just so blatantly pushed as far as things it can answer. I, If it cost one less mana, it would truly be egregious levels of power. Three is, like, the only thing that really keeps it from being beyond broken in my mind. But even at three mana, like, that card is so powerful. So, my my first thought when I saw this card was, why they reprint Convolute at Uncommon? <laughs> Right? My my second thought was, wait, abilities your opponents control? My third thought was for each spell <laughs> Okay, let me let me introduce the Eric's hypotheticals. So <laughs> your opponent you you try to cast a board wipe. Your opponent playing their aristocrat deck sacrifices, puts a bunch of stuff on the stack, does all this things like dirtles around um, tries to do all this stuff with their board, and then you play a whirlwind denial. Suddenly, all those blood arts triggers, all those like card draw triggers, all that everything is stopped, dead in its tracks. It can counter like um, I like. There's nothing this card can't counter, other than cards that literally say it can't be countered. Um, it's insane. It's three mana, which is somewhat sketchy for counter spells, but. I think this effect more than makes up for it. If you've ever seen one of my decks that I post, I always run a negate in my blue decks because negate's a fairly blanket counterspell. It's cheap. It can hit tons of things. 
And I think Whirlwind Denial is going to replace my one counter spell that I run in a lot of different decks that I'm, I'm not trying to play control in. I think this card is like is the quintessential new three mana counter spell. The one to compare it to is Disallow. So Disallow is from Ether Revolt. It's about a th- it's about a six dollar card, which is one blue blue counter target spell activated ability or triggered ability. If someone pays four mana, if that controller pays four mana, they can get out of it. But the fact that this works on multiple targets is I think makes it better because this allows just one target, whereas what I mean it it, it doesn't even have to it doesn't actually target it. So this works against um, on on creatures or cards that might have hexproof. I mean, it, it's even better. It it to me like the the point of the game at which it stops functioning feels like is very very there's a very narrow window in commander. In my my experience playing commander, often what ends up happening is it's it's a race to like the nine ten mana slot where you're just digging and hoping to find like that seven or eight mana aim ending spell and just casting it on curve. This says no to that, and on top of that, it says no to the four other people that responded to try and get value and steal it. The amount of interaction this card just puts on the table for what is otherwise a very, very low downside, like, paying an extra four mana for a spell, that can still also just be a fine mode, right? Like, if someone leads their turn with a very powerful one mana spell like a soul Ring, make them pay four more mana for it, and you time walk them. <laughs> that seems pretty okay to me. Oh man, Disallow is a great comparison, but this card just, just has more modes than it. Right. And so, it, it costs two generic and one blue instead of two blue and one generic. It has never happened in magic history that anyone has ever paid for a Mystic Remora. Like <laughs> or a Mystic Remora tax, you know? Like four mana is just an insane amount. I'm not gonna pay it even if I don't have anything else to do with that four mana. Because why would I wanna pay like four plus mana for this spell? It's it's insane. I like I convolutes a good counter is like probably an okay counter spell because of that like that value is just people don't want to pay that much mana for their spells um so the fact that this hits multiple spells hits triggers hits everything at uncommon why did they print this card i love it <laughs> like i also i i really want to emphasize the amount of triggers this spell counters is a lot. Like, consider when a Blood Artist is on the table and someone nukes the board. All those triggers go on the stack at the same time. Pay for it for all of them. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're not going to have all the triggers. Right. right. Or um, Brago, right? Brago, you can flicker all your yep. all your permanents, right? Uh, that's another example. They all kind of, all those enter the battle, enters the battlefield triggers. And then you say, nah, try again, fam. Or like right. a living death or something like, yeah. or like some other mastery animation spell, and just say no, not no. <laughs> and like those, those effects happen all the time in Commander, and that's just a mode this spell has that so few others do. Like no, I I can't name another spell that has that effect. I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Stifle can't comes to mind. Like that's counter target activated or triggered ability. A, so disallow and Stifle stop one. Right, but to stop the stack. Yeah. Well, there's a red blue counter spell that does that, where you can counter every spell on the counter flux is what it's called, uh, and it, that costs four mana and it doesn't counter abilities. Like there, I think this card just excels in so many ways <laughs> that mm-hmm. it's really the only. Okay, so let me try and think of a downside for this card. Um, I think the downside is. If your opponent already has infinite mana, then it's yeah. not going to do anything. And I think that's mm-hmm. the one case. And I think it's a case that might come up more often in Commander than you would think. Um, because you have a lot of decks that rely on, oh, I'm going to assemble Dramatic Scepter uh, and win with it. Like, no amount of mana taxing will stop me from winning with it. But hear me out. Um, hear me out. What happens, but even, yeah, there, go ahead. What happens when you counter the activated ability of the Dramatic Scepter that's already on the table? Ah. <laughs> All right, so even then, like, no, that's an excellent point. I didn't think about that. <laughs> I think the the only yeah the only downside is you you can counter the you know you you can counter yeah, the spell fair. you can counter uh, whirlwind denial. True, but yeah. saying the spell's downside is it can be countered should show you how powerful the card is. <laughs> right. Well, in that, and also I think I think you might cast it at the wrong time. You might cast it and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm not sure when I'm going to have another opportunity. And then something big happens. You're like, oh, man, if I only had kept it in my hand for another turn. And, you know, so certainly if there's a way you can recast it or send it back to your hand, obviously someone knowing that you have it there, uh, you know, might might put a, 
a wrench into the into your plans. But yeah, if you can if you can cast it with flashback from your graveyard or or you know recurring recurring that spell, I can't wait to see this card. My next commander game, I want someone to play it, and, and I'll, I'll gladly be the the, the sucker that gets uh, that gets denied. No, see, you say that, but now I know the next time I cast a Black Sun Zenith and get 146 insect triggers from Nest of Scarabs, that they're all getting countered. <laughs> and that kills me. <laughs> I, I just I just have a question. Uh, is this spell can be countered the dies to removal for spells? <laughs> <laughs> the dies to removal for blue instance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know this card's great. So you guys brewed some decks. Uh, Sam, you brewed one for Siona. Uh, do you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, over on the subreddit, uh, slash our budget brews, where I used to be a prominent mod, and I occasionally pop in and do some stuff now and again, um, I posted a lovely deck list, uh, two actually, for Siona, Captain of the Pileys. Um all about sort of exploring the directions you can take her. Um, the first draft was a little bit more of let's do some combo-y stuff with Alter Dementia and some combo-y stuff with Alter the Brood. Um, the second draft cut Alter of the Brood and went a little bit more of the fair route to explore, like, let's just see how many enchantresses can go on a deck. Uh, but yeah, you should check it out. It's a great time. Go to that subreddit. I recommend it wholeheartedly. And Eric, you actually also brewed, um, you brewed a Eutropia deck. So we we both grabbed the two uncommon multicolor legends from the set which i just find funny mm-hmm. yeah utropia the twice flavored has a constellation trigger on a commander the, that enough is to get me in the door i love enchantments i love the constellation ability so those things combined i'm just there totally. um, but utropia is actually pretty sweet the deck sort of plays like a combination of an enchantress deck and a regular simic plus one plus one counter deck and that means that you can do a lot of really fun shenanigans with putting counters on things and get random pluses, and uh, it's a whole lot of fun. I posted a $50 and a $30 version to the subreddit. It's a fun time, I, I, and also I've been brewing with Siona, so I definitely recommend both of them if you're interested in brewing for the set. Oh yeah, and price is important. My two Siona decks, I believe, at least they, at the time of uh, posting, they were both under 50 uh, but it was real close. They're probably inflated slightly above or below we'll see where the theros cards go and and prices will drop right because the set just came out i don't think utropia the twice favorite is going to remain 80 cents for that long so i think i think definitely this deck will get lower in price yeah i mean when new sets drop the prices are almost always inflated so yeah yeah awesome and, and i'll have links to those decks here um i'll put them uh on any web page here where this uh podcast is hosted and in any show notes here for for this podcast as well but feel free to check out um the, the subreddit is budget brews um which is where a lot of us hang out so sam of of those cards uh are, is there a commander specifically that you're really excited about brewing Oh, from, from Theros Beyond Death, like, in its entirety? Um, I don't know. I honestly think Siona's... I mean, that's the deck I'm actually building right now because of how much I love mm-hmm. it. But if not Siona, Annex is really cool. You get to run, like, Thermopod, that's this sweet um, sac creature to get red mana, which is bananas in Annex. Um, you get mm-hmm. to run, like, a bunch of threat effects, eat your opponent's creatures, make some satyrs. Like, you can do lots of cool stuff with the deck. I think that would be my other... I really want to build this kind of commander. Eric, what are you thinking? What's your favorite commander? Can I pick the buy a box promo? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I feel a little <laughs> lame for doing that because it's not it's in the set. The set. Um, but uh, Aetherial's Shroud Veiled um, is a does everything I want to do in commander. It, it's an inch, it plays well with destroying creatures. It can steal stuff. Um, it's indestructible. Um, it's white black. I love those colors. Uh, I really like that. If I had to pick a card that is in Theros block proper, um, I would go with Thassa Deep Dwelling. Mono Blue Flicker is an area that has been explored, but it's so... Having a Conjurer's Claws ability on your commander is just such a good ability that I think it's absolutely worth building around uh, if you can have it in your command zone. An indestructible closet, which sounds lame when I say it like that, but <laughs> an indestructible closet is pretty good. <laughs> How about you, Martin? What commander do you want to build around? Boy, I'm kind of torn between uh, Hactos the Unscarred and Galia of the Endless Dance. Um, Hactos just seems like 
uh, it it would be a lot of fun, like a big puzzle, basically, because it's protection from basically every converted mana cost except for one of two, three, or four. So it means if you want to play any spells on it, if you want to have anything that targets it, it has to be just that one converted mana cost. But I feel like maybe you could sort of get there with red and white, and you could probably find ways to flicker Hakdos. So I don't know, I feel like I feel like that could be really interesting and fun to play against. And I just I like just Gallia, the fact that it's it's two mana it it lets you get cards. You're just you're just swinging and you don't care. Art is awesome. Let's just uh, have fun. favorite art in the set. Yeah, speak, by speak. far. <laughs> Very important note about the art. I don't uh-huh. know if you guys have seen it floating around the internet. In the background, there's a satyr with a banana and holding a girl by a ponytail. And it's very weird, but the internet has made tokens of it and all their kinds of things. I highly recommend looking it up if you haven't seen it yet. It's delightful. I've seen a super blurry version, but yeah, he just, it, like, <laughs> I'm really psyched to be at this dance party. Uh, no, it's that's really, really funny. Weird. I don't know. I, th- I really like Hakdos, too, just because he adds a lot of spice to the Voltron build, which can kind of get a little bit like in the doldrums if you're not... like. Or it adds a lot of variety in that sense. Um, and he plays really nicely with, uh, you know, earthquake abilities and uh, mass damage abilities and all that stuff. So, yeah, no, I think Hakdos actually has a lot of potential to be a really fun commander. Totally. All right, well, I think that just about does it. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, hopefully you found something uh, interesting or fun uh, with, with the new cards from Theros Beyond Death. Certainly, if you've got your own thoughts on, we'll put it up, try to put it up as many places as possible so you can download it and listen to it on your favorite devices. We'll link to it on the subreddit. Uh, you can also find us on the Discord. Uh, there is a Budget Brews Discord, and I believe the link for that should be on the website. Um, we'll try to make sure that, that that's something that if that appeals to you, you, you can hop on and, and join us there. Sam, what's the best way to find you? Uh, soon to be Twitter, Licensed Magician on Twitter, uh, and or my Reddit handle, Licensed Magician. Um, that's kind of how you can get in touch with me. I'm going to hopefully be making more of these kinds of things in the future. So stay tuned to find out more. Uh, Eric, what about you? I, uh, I'm on Reddit, uh, as Eric minus zero. That's, uh, the minus key that's next to the zero key and a zero and an underscore in between all that. I should have chosen an easier username, but I guess I just have to suffer with the consequences now. So yeah, if you're on Reddit, uh, feel free to send me a DM if you want help building a deck. I'll probably see it, and I'll probably try and help out in some way. Uh, You can find me on Reddit. I'm mproud. That's M as in Martin. I believe I have the Twitter handle Dollar Commander, so you can also reach me Dollar Commander on Twitter. Uh, I go by Ancestral in pretty much every other Magic community. Uh, So if you find me on Discord, um, you can find me at Ancestral. I think that about does it. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot for listening. See you guys. Bye.